Hello and good morning. Welcome to this lecture on international marketing. Uh, this lecture is actually designed for those who are going to go into international trade and are looking at international expansion within the company or personally going into this business. Now, it's going to be I going to keep it brief and fast as it is just a small part of this program. Now, when you decide to go international uh, the, the main difference between doing an international business or international trade and a normal business is you crossing a border. Now, this crossing a border, it means different cultures, different languages, different rules and regulations. Uh, so it is usually out of reach. It might, it might be the next country, you know, we've got a common border, but still it's a lot of differences. So you don't have access to the same resources you have got usually, and you have to think really hard before taking such decision. Now, the main questions you're going to answer when you're deciding to uh, go international is just up there. You're going to decide why you want to go international, uh, where do you want to go, uh, when, and how you're going to enter that market. So these are the key questions you have to find, and you need a really detailed answer. More you work on it, more information you have got, you're reducing the chance of failure and mistakes and big losses. Now, I'm going to use uh, the model, five-step model, by Sven, uh, I think it's a Sven Hollinson. He is a Danish scholar and he's written a book which is on the, in the notes. You can see it later on and you're welcome to buy his book. It's pretty good. Now, Sven has got these five steps, which you see there, uh, which start to asking the basic question, uh, shall we go international or not? And then it will build on it, you know, which market to enter, uh, the market entry strategy, as you can see up there, then looking at the global marketing program, what kind of marketing program you need to have, and then going obviously to implementation and how really you're going to get it done. Now starting with the, the first step which is what are the considerations? Why would you decide or how you decide to go international? Now let me just get the slide changed if I can see. Yep, got it. Now the main consideration as you can see you're looking at the market you're going to look at that market's economy does it suit your program? Uh, the purchasing power their disposable income, uh, the cost when you know whenever you move your product from one place to another place, it will add on cost being customs, transport, uh, warehousing, distribution, the other taxation like sales taxes which are going to go on it. So uh, after you add all that, is it still affordable? What's the size of the market? What's the culture? Is the product acceptable as it is in that market or not? Or you may need to change it, even rebrand it, repack it. What are the regulations? You know, a lot of goods, if it's got food or is pharmaceutical or electrical, or what, you need to look at the regulation. Does the product uh, satisfy the local regulation or not? Or do you need to uh, introduce changes to it and uh, get it through the regulatory bodies? And that can take time and can be expensive. And after all that, what's the size of this market? Is it big enough for us to enter? Not always we enter a market because it's big. Sometimes we go to a small market for testing our ability to build an international uh, marketing uh, strategy or global marketing strategy. So we may choose a market which is not very big but has got all the other elements we are looking for. Uh, what's the competition down there? What's the corporate culture? Can we you know, find the manpower or type of manpower we need to develop this market? Um, what's the security situation there? You know, can your staff travel there and come back? Your goods can get there and, you know, be distributed without, you know, interruptions. A lot of countries have got the security issues nowadays. The distance. If you've got a bulky product, heavy uh, sort of bulky product with a low value, distance, it costs, you know, a lot to transfer these things. Do they have a seaport or they don't. It's a landlocked country. That would add on to the cost of distribution quite a lot. Uh, what's the business climate? Are they in recession? Are they 
in growth period? Do they have a high inflation? What's the exchange rate situation? And what is it in future? There are other things like you know political risk analysis. Uh, is it stable enough or not? So there are a lot of these things you have to look at it and see which one uh, it is important for your product and your business and can you operate there or not. Problem now, I was going to talk about the motives for internationalization. Why would you go? I know that you can have a proactive, I mean, Spence talk about proactive reasons and reactive reasons. Now, proactive reasons is actually sitting down and thinking about uh, we need growth uh, as a company. Uh, usually management of companies, they are eager to expand and move on, you know, expand the company, get new markets. But there are other reasons as well besides profit and growth is technology, competences, there is a reason there are, now there are you know, possibilities to manufacture part of our goods or all of our goods somewhere else in the world and capture the local market. Uh, getting a, there, there are opportunities comes up, you know, you, 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 you just see a new market coming like China in the last 10-15 years has been growing fast and a lot of products which would have never thought about China as a market, they are all queuing to get down there. So these opportunities come and there are other uh, countries which they, they, they would become uh, possible markets. You have to look at how their development is going. Uh, economy of scale. Usually, if we can increase our manufacturing uh, scale, uh, we get a better price per unit. So expanding and you need more market because your local market already probably is selling as much as you can. Tax benefits. A major issue, the tax benefits are countries which you can uh, I don't know, make your profit and pay less taxes or uh, your production uh, elements are less expensive because of a tax regime. So these are proactive ones. Then there are reactive ones. The reactive one very simple. I mean, you, you in your local market, you can be on a, under pressure. There is too, many, too much competition. You cannot sell as much as you can produce. Your production has gone down and is make it too expensive. Uh, th there are other sort of restriction on local market. The new rules could have come come up. You got overproduction. Uh, you got production capacity which you are not using. Uh, there, there are more. Uh, you. I mean, one of the things is you will see. Uh, orders coming from overseas and you are supplying them as an indirect sort of export and say, okay, uh, it seems that in such and such country, they are really like your product. And uh, so you say, why do I, don't I go direct there? Uh, there is, you know, seasons, for example, there are, uh, if your product has got a season, seasonality and uh, in the north, northern hemisphere, let's say you can sell this product in winter, uh, let's say it's clothing uh, for winter, and then in summer there is no you know market. So you go to the southern hemisphere, you know, which is in winter. Then so you 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 need to go to other market because of a seasonality of a uh, product. The other one is proximity to international customers. It's just next door. It's not that difficult to get to them. I mean, there are, you you can have countries with a lot of common sort of uh, cultural and uh, regulatory issues and we said look it's easy to go to to the next door uh, market and do it so those are reactive things these are which are obviously there and you know it it is looking at you in your face to say look let's just expand and go to the next market now the next step which market you know, we looked at all those reasons for going internationally. Within that research, hopefully, uh, some markets become more obvious. So you will be looking, okay, yes, why not going there? Uh, so the, 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 these markets, they're not just coming out of the blue. Within your initial research of going international, uh, these issues have come up. But there is this, this uh, sort of a schematics a graph which you can use. We're looking at... Uh, four quarters, four sections, they've got a low demand on adaptation. That means it's simple. Your product can just go there without a lot of changes to it. The rules and regulation allows this product to move on to that market. Uh, 
against it, you have got a high demand adaptation. That means the product packaging has to change, maybe a specification of it has to change, and so on. So that would be an expensive way of getting into it. So then you have got on this side, you got the uh, low establishment barriers. That means you, you don't have massive quota against you or uh, tariffs, high tariffs against your product. It's easy to enter into the into that market. And against that, you have got a very high establishment barriers. That means it's tariffs, there are quotas. Uh, you have to get it through the local, let's say, licensing for if it's a pharmaceutical or whatever. Now, if you look at this sort of graph, you will see that obviously, if you've got a low demand adaptation, that means easy entry of the product, and then at the same time, you have got a uh, low establishment of barriers, that means there's hardly any barriers to get in. That's a grab and act, and you take that market, move in, get it, uh, your marketing uh, sort of tools sorted out and resources there and get your product there. Now, the worst part of it is when you've got a high adaptation, need for you know change of the product a lot, and a lot of barriers to get in. So you keep out of that market, that's too expensive and too high a high price to pay for a very little gain. Yeah, and then you've got the, the aim correctly and sustainable sort of thing. This is judgment on the product, but you will get this information by looking at the, the custom regulations and uh, uh, other regulatory bodies within that country, and it will give you a pretty good sort of picture of what is there. Now, we, let's say we decide on market, you know, we have looked at the market, chosen some market, now you're going to decide how you're going to enter this market. To enter a market, a lot of things, ways of getting in, but let, let's just, just uh, Sven is talking about how do you, s the selection strategy, which I like his, his way of looking at it. He said the naive rule. Uh, the naive rule is if you're looking at a multiple market, we just say we're going to use the same strategy and model for more marketing, for all of these, the same one for everybody. It's a global strategy. It it works in some situations. It, it's not working in some other situations. If you've got a simple product like, like Coca-Cola or a fizzy drink, well, it's the same. It's the nature of it doesn't change. There's very little to do about it, and uh, everybody knows about it. So uh, the, the local food and... Uh, whatever regulatory body would look at it is sugar and water. So you can get in and a common sort of advertising usually work and you, they usually have the same promotional strategy and so on. It doesn't work for every kind of product. More uh, pro uh, complicated the product than there are, you know, sort of this simple uh, way of looking at it doesn't work. Now the next one when talking about is a pr pragmatic Rule. The pragmatic rule is the one which probably most of uh, small to medium companies have to use. This is looking at each market and making a decision on your whole strategy and market entry and distribution and everything for what is suitable for that market. That's a pragmatic one, is, uh, which makes sense to me anyway. In most cases, that's the way you have to do it because markets are not homogeneous and you have to you know, consider them in certain way, uh, consider cultural issues and regulations. And so then, then, then the final part is talking about the strategy rule. The strategy rule is looking at a multiple number of markets and see the different entry models for each one and what and the design is strategy. So you don't need to change too much from, you know, each market, from one market to another, but still you have got this, uh, a commonality through it, uh, which makes sense. But uh, as I said, if you are entering into international market, you go for a pragmatic rule because you're looking at a one or two market altogether. You're not going to go global in one go. You do the test marketing and so on. So, so gradually you would move to this strategy uh, rule the way obviously you cannot just keep you know, coming up with new models every time. Next slide, if I can get to it with that. Okay, now. What's the entry? How do we are, are we going to choose our entry uh, model? Uh, the, it, it, on the graph you will see there. Are, if you are risk averse, I mean you don't want to take a lot of risk. You know you cannot take risk. You're a small company. 
you cannot lose money on these businesses uh, or you want control you say I'm not worried about the risk but I want to have more control on what's happening to my product what's happening in the market what kind of promotion is put in the market and so on and then we move to full flexibility that I can do everything I can manufacture locally I can rebrand it so talking moving from a top part of a uh, this spectrum of being risk averse to the full flexibility that would tell you which type of entry you can use. Now, for reducing risk, you go to the export mode because, from an export mode, a simple one I sell it at my factory door. Well, get me the money, get the goods, and move it. All the way talking, going towards the uh, using uh, agents. Uh, export houses and so on so you you always you got a lot less risk because you are usually in possession of your goods before it leaves but then you don't have much of a control what happens when it goes to that market because the importer has bought it he takes it there he distributes it and he can make whatever claims he usually can and you usually you don't have access to him you don't even know what he's talking about down there moving further down we use inter <laughs> intermediate modes. I mean, intermediate mode is just having a an agent locally. Probably you got uh, got the, somebody who works only for you. Uh, you got to move towards as you're moving further down into the market. is It's more expensive because you have to set up the local this you know, sort of warehousing probably or distribution or go into partnership. And this gives you obviously more control. You have a say now. You are a partner there. Uh, and all the way to going joint venture and local production, licensing and franchising, uh, which obviously it, it's a lot more complex. Uh, you're putting a lot more money than just putting your products on the line. And uh, you have to know the market a lot better. Uh, you've got a very high level of control, but the risks are really high because you're doing a local investment, you've got the exchange risk about against you, political possibilities, security risk, and so on. So you need to know your market very well. You need to have very good legal advisors to understand how the whole country works. Now, moving forward, now we're going to look at this example of different method of entries, the export mode, the intermediary modes, and you got the the uh, the, the going you know into you know, local production having a full chain uh, distribution chain under your own control uh, it, it you just can follow it and you can see how how, how it works but probably it, the, the simple one which is export mode and it's uh, you know you got a distributor an importer or a dealer who comes and buy it from you and you can see that from the borderline it's gone the product is gone he takes it through his retail chain and or local retail chain and get it to the customer. Now to the other end of a spectrum where <clears throat> you are into a joint venture or uh, a local partner you have appointed and you have gone probably into uh, some sort of a agreed shareholder or subsidiary or sole agent which you are actually in control of product or you have got a company which you share in it and have got a local you know warehousing facilities and so on so the goods are still within the uh, your own ownership or joint ownership before it goes to the local retail ch uh, channels and so on so you you are more involved but as I said then you are really down there in that country uh, whatever export modes you use then you have to go into designing what is your marketing plan which is just getting towards the final end of implementation. Now, what are the... I'm trying to get the slide changed. Okay, got it. Now, the, we, we are here looking at the... Uh, assuming we're going to go all the way in, we're going to have uh, uh, our own sales subsidiary down there, uh, our own warehouse, uh, possibly even a retailer and the end customer coming to the retailer. There was some, somebody like, like, like Marks and Spencer. I mean, 
deciding to go to France. I mean, they were in France. They a few years ago they closed uh, their their retail units. Now they have gone back again, which they are in full control of in the production as well. So it's a big investment uh, because you have to get all the. Uh, local warehousing, the retail units, the manpower, the system in place. You know, uh, in case of Marx Spencer going from France to from England to France, so you need to do everything in, in French as well. So your computer systems have to be slightly changed and so on. So that's uh, the end model of it. The, the the toughest model to decide to go into. Now, major types of exporting. Now we're going to look at it as we talk about it. Indirect exporting, low risk, people come, buy it from you, take it wherever they want to go. Direct exporting and cooperative exporting, which obviously as it goes down that line, it gets more sort of, uh, you would be more involved with it. Indirect export mode is suitable for small companies, uh, small to medium companies. Uh, usually, if you just have a surplus production for temporarily, you just need to get rid of it and you find people who want to buy it. Or there are, you have historically buyers who comes and buy from you, just contact them and you push it through this channel. The, you can use export agents, uh, what we call buying agents, the brokers, the export uh, management companies, trading companies, or you can go piggy bank. These are different styles of inter indirect entry modes. I'm going to go through them one by one. The export buying agent. The export buying agent is actually representative of the buyer or the importer. So he is taking the uh, care of the interest of the person who is buying the goods from you. He's going to negotiate the price, the best price he, he can get, and he will move the goods uh, out. So you really don't know what happens to the goods and you may not even know who is the end user or buyer. But it's the simplest one. You don't do anything, you're just selling. The next one is the broker. Now the broker is more of a middleman. He is acting on behalf of both parties, the buyers and sellers, they bring them together. Their main job is to negotiate the, the price and the condition of sales and get the goods moving. Uh, their primary interest is getting a deal done. So they get a commission from one end or both end, usually from both end, and the goods are moved. In both of these cases, the 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 relationship may be it usually you know is not long term relationship. It can be one off or maybe continuous. But I mean, you don't have that. Uh, there is no agreement to carry on and so on. So that is good for. Uh, when you have just a surplus, you want to sell it and you want to move it, and uh, that's it. The problem solved. Until next time, you may contact them. Now, the export management companies are quite different. This is the first step to go into global. Export management companies, they actually act as your export division or department. It's cheaper because you don't have this the whole manpower, expertise of logistic and international marketing and you know chasing for buyers they do that they find the buyers uh, so it, it, it sounds very good they are good but there are some you know uh, disadvantages as well because they usually act on behalf of number of clients so uh, they're not just acting on your behalf so there's and usually they may have competitive products within their uh, product range so and also they look for where the where they make the most money. So and if your product is not a best seller, or you're not giving them a higher enough commission, they may not pay enough attention to your product. Now you got the export management company. See if I can get the next slide. Disadvantages, as I said, they they are commission based, so their focus is depends on where they get the highest commission. Uh, they. As I said, have got more clients. Now the piggyback situation. Piggyback situation is uh, when a small company, your company is not big enough, would go with a company which is exporting to the same market. Usually the product lines are similar. And you say, look, you do my export as well. Obviously they charge you something. But they have a distribution uh, 
resources and whatever is needed in local market mainly happen with the small car manufacturers. You will see they would piggyback with the larger car manufacturers. Car manufacturers, if they are exporting into a country, usually the importing country put certain rules like you know they should have so many service stations. They have to have a certain amount of stock of uh, spare parts. So so obviously when the the car goes down there and if something happened to it, it's just you know uh, not left on the side of the road. Now this can be very expensive entry cost. So what you do, you go and join uh, another car manufacturer who already is in the market and has got his the distribution channel, the service sort of stations, the, uh, the warehousing for spare parts and all those. And you will say, look, can you sell my car as well? And you come to a deal, you agree with them and their dealers and distribution channels would move your cars as well. So that's a piggyback model. Uh, as I said, it works in the car industry. And if I can go to the next slide, yes, direct export mode. Now we are getting really now into it. What the next step is, you find a local company in the country, destination country you want to send your goods. You come to an agreement, which they become your direct representative down there. They're your sole agents. They would agree they would not sell any other similar products and you in return would give them that you are not going to deal with anybody else. Now here as you can see we're going to go into a contractual agreement that each party would agree to a certain amount, a certain behavior let's say. Uh, and that's the beginning of getting more control. Uh, on your local market. As you can see, already you are saying, I'm not going with anybody else, I'm going to be with you, so you're taking certain risks, because what if they cannot deliver? What, what if they cannot distribute as much as uh, you want in that market? Or they, you know, promotion package is not good enough. So they, they already you're taking risks when you're going, but that's the beginning, you have to find a local partner is almost impossible to just go into a country with not without knowing anybody now let me see if i can go to the next one well the next stage is usually you have got an agent before going to this stage i haven't seen any company just go straight into uh, contract manufacturing which is the intermediate entry mode which is either contract manufacturing licensing franchising uh, a joint venture or strategic alliance. These are really big sort of commitments. And before that, always there is an first an agent agreement or a local company which is in partnership and you are doing a distribution and you're taking the goods and you know you already established the product locally and then you will go into further down the line into taking you know uh, investment into that local market and moving into higher level of involvement. Now in conclusion, what you gotta do, set your strategy right, decide what you wanna do, uh, where you wanna go, how you wanna you know, sort of develop your expansions around the world, which markets are, then you're gonna look at the circumstances which are decisive, on what basis you will decide I'm going to go into this market or that market. So you have done your analysis, you've got multiple norm markets in front of you, they all have got pros and cons and you are probably looking at which one. So you have to decide on what basis I would choose this one rather than that one and how that, that would uh, move on. And that's your organic growth which is deciding okay, now I've captured this market, I made these mistakes, now I know my way, what is the next market to go on? So step by step you would go. Remember once you have established your export department, you know, people there, you're going to international exhibitions. So a, a major cost of it is already done. So moving to the one market is expensive, but moving to second market is not as expensive. Especially if you are going into trade areas, which is less barriers between the trade areas, like you already have entered EU, let's say via United Kingdom. Now, 
expanding to France or Germany is not as expensive. Already your, your goods are within the free trade area of EU. It can move, move around. So although there is a lot more to do, but a lot of licensing or regulatory work is done already. So moving forward, what you're going to just re-emphasize on the main issues, just as a conclusion, you're going to make sure you've got a clear strategy and direction, uh, start close to home, you know, the close to home I, is not necessarily, I'm talking about geographical sort of dimension, it, there are a lot of countries uh, uh, which you feel closer to them because of a historic uh, relationship between the two countries. Maybe the the laws are based on the same sort of uh, historic laws. I mean, it, it might, I mean, like let's say within the Commonwealth uh, countries, which have got a lot of similarities on taxation and laws and so on. So, so it, it start close to home, but not just physically on the cultural, legal, and all those other things. Adapt to the situations now. In some countries, you just go indirect exporting or exporting. If you got to go into a country like for a joint venture, you may decide it's better to do acquisition, buying a local company which has got the you know the distribution channels and certain manufacturing power, rather than going greenfield and say, so look, I'm going to start from scratch myself. So usually acquisition is better, but it can be expensive. Uh, and it's usually difficult to know uh, what's the value of that in that country as you're not familiar with it. Uh, in many cases, once you are on this route and you are going into international money, you go to exhibition, you talk to people, there are you know, clients who come to you, windows of opportunities would come and you have to identify which one is real and is real opportunity and which one is a pitfall and it's going to be a, where I'm going to make a mistake and loss. But Definitely, they will come your way, and you have to identify them. And uh, you have to accept from outside that I need a uh, manager your experience for exporting. If you haven't been doing exporting, you have to buy the, these expertise. When you're going into a new country, you have to accept I don't know them, we don't know about their culture, their rules and regulations. Get the local expertise, buy it. They call them consultants, they call them lawyers, they call them whatever. The, you know, the money spent there is highly desirable. I know people don't want to add on to the cost of going international, but these are your insurances against big losses uh, in the future. I think uh, finally we're going to the marketing and communications, obviously. Uh, you have to give attention to uh, the local language, the corporate values, national values, what means what in that country. Test everything before going public, uh, especially on advertising or news releases. Make sure it makes sense locally, it does, it's not offensive, uh, and so on. The name of product, the brand image, everything has to be tested. and. Uh, and make sure you get your corporate message right as well. You don't want to be seen that we are coming down to take and grab and make money and run away. Uh, invest in people and money, you have to do it. Show it that you are not just there to make a profit and make a run. And if you get all those things right, I think you got a pretty good chance of developing it and developing your first market, second market, and so on after that. I think we had enough now. <laughs> I see you later. Bye.